I was, so you find me somebody else. Yeah, All right. <clears throat> so, hi. My name's uh, Adrian, and I'm in. No, wait, that's the wrong meeting. Um, <laughs> That's, sorry, I had to start with something funny. Uh, I actually manage uh, IT operations for CBI, um, and I get to introduce the speakers for the rest of the day for this wonderful room. Um, you probably know why you're here and, uh, and who you're going to be listening to. But anyway, um, if you are interested in building a sturdy foundation, Stephen Legg will get you off on the right foot. I worked on that all day. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Legg. Hello. Uh, as as uh, my colorful introduction mentioned, I'm Stephen Legg. Uh, this is Building a Sturdy Foundation, a program-based approach to IT operations and InfoSec and business. So um, I want to talk first to kind of about the goal of the research that drove this and really of the talk, and that is to kind of uh, understand the challenge that companies face in developing their approach um, to security, uh, frame kind of the impact that that you know, having or not having that approach is going to have on them, and then define, give, give, give you guys hopefully some uh, starting points that you can evaluate or, you know, see if they fit into your environment or your approach to where you can fill some gaps in your, in your security approach, um, and then ultimately drive better conversations about information security in, in all communities. Um, so, obligatory disclaimer, and I apologize, I'm getting over a, a respiratory infection, so if I sound like a frog, that's why. Uh, these are my thoughts, words, this is research I've been doing. Uh, they don't represent any of the employers, colleagues, or anyone that I work with. Um, I'm also, I also want to add uh, at this stage, this, I'm going to have to cover a lot of material in this talk. So if you have uh, specific questions uh, that, are, that are pretty quick, you can ha feel free to interrupt me. But if it's longer, you want to have a dialogue about it, let's talk after, because I do want to make sure I get through the whole, the whole presentation. So again, I'm uh, Zen Mode, uh, Stephen Legg. Um, I'm an information security uh, strategy consultant. I'm also a mentor, a dad. I was an IT director at one point, a senior security engineer, and an entrepreneur. You can catch me on Twitter at @zenmode. Uh, I'm a founding member of DLESec, which uh, if you haven't checked it out or played it, we're actually doing the CTF here at uh, B-Sides and Converge. Uh, I'm a POSTEC developer. I work mostly on uh, some of the system hardening and auditing modules. Uh, which will be coming out very soon, uh, since we just started doing code review on that. Uh, and I'm the host of my success field. Um, I also like to play games. Uh, and I like really hard games. And that's one of the reasons that I got it, got together with Jason Brown to develop the Capture the Flag games that we play. Uh, but I think a lot of people playing games or CTFs or doing our job feel like this lady sitting here. Uh, um, amongst all of the warriors that are going in to face the fire-breathing monster. Um, so the reason I, I like this, this particular game so much is because I feel like it parallels our experience in InfoSec so much. Uh, in other video games, you know, you go through, they give you some prompts, they tell you move left, or move the controller left to turn left, press this button to jump. Uh, in Dark Souls, they teach you how to use the controls and then put you in a room with an unkillable monster. So uh, that's kind of how a lot of us feel, I think, coming into our first or second or third uh, IT application development, infosec jobs. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that experience transitions very well into some of the uh, hopelessness that people feel around get implementing areas of their security that they may not necessarily be familiar with or familiar with planning for. So um, that leads me to the story. Uh, so this is a story you probably have all, all heard in some form or another or experienced firsthand. Uh, you know, upper management says, I saw this breach on TV the other day. I want to know what this is all about. Uh, we need to do something about this. Uh, we have that compliance budget that's been sitting around. Let's do something with it. Let's get compliant. It's time for business. Bunch of, you know, upper management doing what upper management do. They t start talking numbers, 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 business. Is this working? Make it so, IT people. Go, IT manager. Go, director. Go, senior security people and engineers. Yay, we did things. We're happy. We're solving problems. Our risks are managed, guys. Meanwhile, the rest of us are like, 
well, uh, hold on. Uh, so you want to get compliant. You want to install blinky boxes and change a couple settings, and you want to think that that's good enough. Uh, no. The end is near, and you, we are going to go up in flames soon. And then your IT manager, or director, or you if that's you, uh, or senior engineer, looks at the problem. <laughs> Can't really get their head around how they're actually going to do this. And then you engage the ultimate response. Blinders. <laughs> Literally all of your problems are gone. Just close your eyes, unplug the internet. Guys, it's leading security research. We're doing work here. This is the best li life hack for things that you don't like in your life. And so, we're good. Everything's fine. Oh, something bad happened. That should do the trick. We're in good space. And meanwhile, in our heads, the practitioners are waist deep in tribbles. And we have no idea what's going on, really. And we just want to come in and do the things and secure the systems. And then we look back when bad things happen at our management and say, winter's coming. And in fact, I knew about winter before it was cool, guys. I'm freaking InfoSec hipster over here, okay? But even in that situation, we're actually wrong. Winter's already here. We're in the middle of it. One in 200 companies is breached daily. Tons of breaches happen all the time without people knowing. It takes over 200 days for people to even realize that they are breached. And so to you, I say, you know nothing, Jon Snow. And more importantly, even the things you do know, because of time, no budget, no support, no team. Maybe you have a team and they're all just fighting fires the way you are. This is from the DBIR. 60% of security inc incidents are attributable to errors made by us. We are part of the problem, and we need to start acknowledging that. And so I'm calling you to action right now with this talk. There's tons of free resources out there, things that you can do that cost no money, that you just have to take a little bit of time and look into them. I'm going to go into that. And one of my favorites to where I started looking at this was with the SANS, Critical Controls. Uh, I think version 6 is on its way out soon, uh, but this is version 5. Uh, for those of you that have not seen this, um, these are the major areas that they've identified uh, of information security or things that impact information security. You can go great into detail. I'm not going to do that. Um, but if you want to check those out, this is the URL. Go to sans.org slash critical security controls um, and, and take a look. So thinking about all of these areas, what do they all have in common? Guys, what do they all have in common? Security is one there. So what they all have in common is that they all take time to implement. And there's a lot of complexity in many areas. And you can dig really deep in these rabbit holes. So that forces us, because we have limited time, we're always going to be in a situation where we have limited resources, right? We have to Pareto it. We've got to use the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle, and bake in security from the start. Make sure that we're not constantly going back and reiterating our security in different areas by having a plan, a unified strategy to move forward with. So now let's get dangerous. Let's, I've talked, you know, kind of laid the, laid the groundwork for the story and how this all fits together. Let's talk about the approach. Um, so basically, and I'm going to go kind of fast through this area because there's a lot I got to cover. Uh, we need all of these things, right? Asset management, capacity, communications, configuration, all these things. These are all important or have some kind of impact on the posture of a company's information security. So now what we need to rate those things. So part, as part of the research that drove this talk, uh, I developed a, uh, what I'm calling a secure operations maturity model, which is based on the CMM. Um, that is just meant to kind of relate the overall perspective on where those areas are falling. So 
what I'll say to you before we go through this, because I'm about to hit you with a bunch of stuff, is let's keep calm and do this together. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. You just look very questiony. Well, I'm not going to troll you. Okay. I'm holding back. Okay. Contain the troll. So asset management. Uh, if you don't know, asset management is the program primarily concerned with ensuring that software and hardware used in the business is accounted for and in the intended user's possession and being used the way it's intended to. This includes uh, many extremities that are not technology related, like financial, contractual, and inventory functions, all of that rolling obviously into life cycle conversations. Now what the asset management does, practically speaking, or one of the things it does, is assist in addressing the theft and misuse of company hardware and software. You know, you know where your laptops are, you know who's got them. You have policies around that. You've got tracking in them. If they get stolen, you've got, you know, uh, some system auditing your environment day to day and scanning for new assets. Capacity management here, we're talking about uh, how you manage everything from storage space, compute, um, you know, system memory, all of the resources, network, you know, your, your bandwidth on your internal and external network. Um, it's how you plan and, and deal with denial of service situations. Uh, change management is talking about here standardized processes for proced and procedures for when handling IT changes. That's both on the application development side of the world and the IT ops side of the world. Um, really what that does is contain or, or the, the goal of it is to contain the uh, kind of risks that come up with unapproved changes or changes that aren't well thought out before they're implemented. Communications management uh, ensures that your communication channels are happening and communication is happening on your network in the way that you intend. Some examples of this are, you know, not sending, you know, critical information or, you know, PII, EPHI through unencrypted channels, encrypting it at rest, uh, things like that. Um, and it assists in managing the, those risks or the risks around the movement of that data. Uh, configuration management, of course, is all talking about system states, uh, coordination and evaluation of changes in IT systems from a management standpoint. Uh, this would be things like, you know, application whitelisting, uh, po you know, policies to control uh, usage of different systems or applications. Uh, and that really assists in keeping non-standard system states from biting you in the ass. Uh, data management here, we're talking about um, identifying, categorizing, and then uh, building controls around data uh, at on a by use basis and by severity basis. So that assists you in understanding, you know, what kind of DLP or data loss prevention steps you need to take, how you classify your data, and what other controls you need to put in place, and that keeps you uh, aware and able to plan strategies around the management of your data time, you know, over time. Uh, event management here, we're talking about. Uh, all the events are, are like forensic logging that you're doing in your environment and what data sources you're configuring, how you're configuring them, what data you're consolidating and analyzing, that kind of stuff. Uh, that keeps you uh, aware of what desired activity and undesired activity is going on in your network and those are the kind of risks that you can mitigate by effectively managing it. Identity and access management is basically making sure that the principals that are using your stuff are who they say they are and they're doing what they should be doing. Uh, it, it largely accounts for like things like remote working, VPN users, uh, you know, s things like segregation of duties or rights assignment, uh, and also assists in preventing that those unauthorized or unintended use cases for you know even authorized users. Incident management is a big one. Uh, it's one where a lot of companies, even larger companies, fall down. Uh, this is going to preside mostly over how your uh, collecting and data, responding to incidents, and managing incidents as they happen in your business. Uh, and that, that helps you minimize the damage. It's like, you know, having a, rear, a very good uh, plan for fires in your building when it goes up in flames. That make, can make the difference between saving hundreds of lives and losing everybody, or, you know, very, only very few people surviving. Uh, infrastructure management, as I've defined it here, is really talking about the architectural considerations for the design of the network and making sure that they're consistent with the rest of these areas in terms of what controls need to be in place. That's everything from how you air gap or VLAN or segment your network to, you know, how you harden your systems, what kind of standards you're using for that hardening process, and, uh, and what things look like at the end of that. 
Um, that really assists you in, in kind of keeping both your, your threat surface down and in the event that somebody does breach uh, a particular segment of your network, gives you more ability to maintain and control it. Uh, IT continuity management, we're talking about, you know, business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, and also the con security controls and implementation of controls around those systems that do that. Um, what that does is assist you in reducing the time necessary to resume those business functions in the event that you have some kind of disaster recovery scenario. Um, life cycle management here, we're talking about uh, everything from like, you know, the software development life cycle to IT operations life cycles and hardware life cycles within the business. Uh, so it's pretty wide. Uh, we'll, we'll only cover a few areas in this talk, but um, it really assists in preventing exploitation and misuse of uh, outdated code, data, and systems at, at a general level, and that's common across all the different iterations of life cycles. And then the last one, vulnerability management, uh, really is meant to assess the uh, software, firmware, and systems that are uh, on your network to cla identify, classify, remediate, and mitigate those vulnerabilities that exist in a organized and methodical fashion so that you're closing the doors that are most likely to create a problem for you and assist you in mitigating risks around that. So how I've applied this. Well, that was a mouthful. Uh, how I've applied this. I, I did some case studies uh, with a few businesses that I won't identify, but I'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about them. Uh, the first one is a manufacturing company. Uh, they have one site around 120 users. I think it's some, somewhere between, like around 30 and 40 office users, and the rest are shop floor employees. Um, so the state of their business, uh, is mostly here. Uh, you can see that they had in place a few systems. Um, they used, uh, you know, things like Office 365. They used uh, a company that outsourced their disaster recovery for them and managed the appliance that was on, and they had some other folks that were helping them with their IT. So the second business is a financial company. Um, they're a trading organization. Uh, and they're multi-site. They have you know, around... 300 users, 280. Um, they, this is the state of their business. Uh, they used a lot of Windows-based systems. Um, they used or had an internal domain environment, and these are the, this is the state of their business in terms of the programs that they had. Uh, don't worry, this won't be the last time you see this. Uh, so business number three was a healthcare organization. They're multi-site around you know, 400 plus users. Those users are everything from office staff to, you know, medical practitioners and people that are, you know, healing the sick and doing good work. Um, this is the state of their business. They had an excellent network team. Um, you know, they had some, like, open source, good open source appliances for both ticketing and a few other things. Um, so they're, like, change management and other, other uh, unified management systems like that were more mature for them. Uh, now, what's common between all of them is these are their constraints. Uh, they, they had some budget or not much budget. You know, they, they had the people they had, you know, and, and the low, low end, they had like one or two people responsible for their systems. On the high end, there was like five, six, uh, with maybe a couple development staff. Those people um, had very little experience with security. They were mostly either IT operations or development folks. Uh, and so as a result of that, they had not a lot of familiarity with InfoSec tools or tools that would help them improve their security and they didn't have a lot of time. So if we think about small and medium business and what we can do to secure small and medium business, the, very commonly the problem is uh, they, don't, they don't have time, they don't have people, they don't have money. And I know that's common everywhere, but it's especially, especially a problem in the SMB space. Uh, so the way that you deal with that is to use what you have. If it's 30 minutes a day, if it's an hour a day, do something. Don't don't think that you're too small or that you 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 know don't have something valuable. Small organizations have plenty of valuable things. In fact, you know, with all the larger breaches going on today and that have happened in recent history, a lot of those larger organizations are now upping their security budgets. They're hardening up. So criminals are in an automated fashion the way they have for years are just reinforcing their efforts to attack those other businesses that have fewer controls and, and in an aggregate fashion have just as much to lose and, and give the criminals just as much to gain. So I encourage you, if you work in an organization like that, do some of this stuff. Uh, let's first talk about assets capacity and change. We'll start that off by talking about business one and asset management. 
So once again, this is why we were qual or classifying asset management here. So what we did, uh, we helped them develop like a quarterly inventory process using some open source tools. Um, we also leveraged their uh, remote monitoring and management platform uh, to generate some of that some of that data. Uh, that some of it came from Active Directory. Some, as I mentioned, came from their RMM platform. Uh, in this case, it was LabTech. Um, if you have something like this, keep in mind a lot of the audit data here is great for asset management. It's a great tool to use for asset management. Now, this isn't free, but uh, you know some other tools that are free are things like SpiceWorks. You can use SpiceWorks in a limited capacity to, to scan and gra grab asset data. Um, and it's not as deep maybe as paid solutions, but it is, it is a good place to start. So now let's talk about capacity management in Business 3. Uh, capacity management, once again, is the process of planning for, monitoring, and adjusting your uh, purchasing plans, you know, life cycle around the capacity that you have to accomplish different things within the environment. Uh, so what we did with them, or what I did with them, was uh, depending on the volatility of the, the systems and how much they varied. Uh, we developed weekly and monthly reports on research usage. Um, you know, everything everything's listed here. You know, so everything from storage to, to memory to everything, to available assets. And then we would do a quarterly review of those benchmarks to understand how their needs were growing and how they needed to adjust their purchasing habits and other things around that. And we did a lot of that with simple tools, you know, things that are built into Windows. Performance monitor. Performance monitor set up an aggregate gives a lot of great data and it's not that hard to put it together. Uh, some other things we did, um, we use Nagios with them uh, but I also wanted to mention Zabbix. <laughs> Zabbix is built on Nagios uh, and is kind of an extension of it. It gives some more enterprise reporting, uh, some great uh, uh, like data interpretation and dashboards and a little bit more control over what you're seeing. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's open source. It's free. They do have a paid version, too, and they have support and all that all that stuff. But uh, it's something great to play around with if you don't have something to help you with managing capacity management because it can pull all that data. It also is pretty decent for asset management as well. So now let's talk about change management in the context of business one. Uh, change management ensures that those standardized procedures uh, are used when handling uh, IT changes. For these guys, uh, what we did was form a small change, con change control board um, from the appropriate management and IT folks. Uh, they only had one IT guy, and they had a couple managers that were presiding over IT responsibilities and risk. So those are the folks that were managing those changes. And then we leveraged their existing ticketing system with a new status approval loop for that change control board. And then connected their uh, compliance team, who, who had just started an ISO program, um, with reporting for verification. So uh, one of the things the, the the things they used to drive data was their system center uh, implementation, um, which connected with their ConnectWise implementation. Though those tools um, are not free, but uh, there are plenty of open source uh, ticketing systems out there. There's a lot that are you know built on Ruby. If you just Google uh, the, those open source ticketing systems that'll help you out. Another thing we did with them was implement it because they had a, a one guy that developed their ERP system and did a lot of work with the, with uh, generating reports and, and other data analysis tools for them. Uh, OWASP, if you've never looked at it, OWASP is awesome. They give uh, you know secure SDLC uh, process that'll overlay on an agile or uh, waterfall methodology. Uh, and their secure SDLC cheat sheet is a great quick win for people that have, you know, either budding app dev programs or app dev programs that are in place that don't have a lot of security steps in them. It's a great way to add some. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, communications configuration and data. Uh, for, as far as communications management goes, uh, again, we're talking about managing risks around those communication mediums. Um, so part of that was uh, air gapping, VLANing their network off. We uh, restricted all but those approved types in and out. You know, set up proxies. If, if proxies are great and not a lot of people use them, not enough people in my opinion, uh, typically if you have licensing for anything, and even if you don't, you can set up a Linux server 
uh, any number of open source proxy servers that can help you. Um, but that, that can mitigate a lot of risks that come in through the web and also encrypt all of things. Uh, they, again, used Office 365, um, but they also had um, some other open source tools like... Um, uh, they used... Um, <coughs> pardon me. They used... Uh, TrueCrypt to, to encrypt a lot of their, their external media because they were really overly dependent on external media in some cases. So as a first step, that was a good start for them. So from a configuration management standpoint, uh, again, we're talking about managing uh, non-standard system states and risks associated with that. Uh, we used Active Directory, we used group policy to enforce like application whitelisting, uh, restricted the rights for users to manage those systems, and then in, in implemented WSYS to manage that patch management. Um, we also use software restriction policy to manage that software state. You can also do that, like if you've got, um, if you're working in a Linux domain or you want open, you know, your open source shop, um, a lot of the uh, functionality, you can, you can accomplish similar things with things like Puppet. Uh, there's great, uh, like, tool sets out there if you just go to the puppet website they have really cool little uh, packages that you can download and install and they help you accomplish those things in a more automated fashion without having to script a bunch of stuff yourself so now let's talk about data management uh, again this is going to assist in prevent preventing theft of company data and data warehouses with these guys um, we did a lot of work with especially with OWASP uh, we worked with their development staff to identify, classify, and restrict access to data based on the, the use case of that data and who needed access to it. And then we supported their change management process around SDL through a better understanding of those data types and needs. So uh, OpenSAM, OpenSAM is the, again, that uh, one the, the framework that overlays very well with Waterfall and Agile uh, from OWASP. And if you want to check it out, that's the URL. So now let's talk about event management, IT continuity management, and vulnerability management. From an event management perspective, again, we're talking about how we're, how and what we're logging and how we're aggregating it. There you go. You want me to leave it up for a second? Be good. All right. So, uh, okay, so that, again, we're talking about what data we're collecting. Uh, so with, with them, just making some changes to the domain, to some of the local hosts through group policy, uh, was able to maximize their SIM. They were just using OSIM, uh, and that, that is definitely worth take, checking out if you haven't. I'll, I'll get to more to that, too. Then we set up some quarterly exercises to set, test specific abuse cases and be sure the SIM caught them. Basically, we went and grabbed some of the forensic data that we could find on some you know, common exploits that they were concerned about and then planted that to see if the sim would grab it. Uh, for those of you that work in a window shop, if you haven't seen from Randy Franklin Smith's Ultimate Windows Security, check it out. It's awesome stuff. He gives all kinds of free training. Uh, it's really, really excellent. And he, he even brings a lot of vendors in, not from a sales capacity, but to talk about how uh, the right design methodology around event management can overlay very well into any number of products and how specific products may be a, an advantage to your company depending on uh, what what your particular goals are. So let's talk briefly about IT continuity management again here. IT continuity management uh, again is reducing time necessary to reduce business and IT service functions following an event and also to protect those backup systems. Uh, most companies talk about doing DR tests, but don't actually do them, uh, and they should. Uh, you should also do data recovery tests. You should make sure that you can restore data, make sure that it's good, it's usable, and you can put it back in place. Uh, and then, really, we created some metrics around the performance of that. So we, we set a timeline and a goal. Uh, we let them play to that goal, and then we measured the progress of... Uh, or the, the time elapsed over those exercises and tests. So now let's talk about vulnerability management. 
again, this is talking about how we're assessing vulnerabilities in systems and remediating them and classifying them. Uh, again, in this case, this is the financial company. Um, we subscribe there to FS Isaac and some other uh, vulnerability communities or alert vulnerability communities provided that threat intelligence that they needed. And then the, they actually had one InfoSec guy. Uh, and so we, we connected him with their IT operations group to kind of enhance that patch management program. Um, and they actually didn't have a VM appliance of any kind, and they didn't have budget to add one. So we st or I started them off with trying out OpenVOS, which, the, you know, doesn't have the same quality as some of the paid products out there, but it's a great start. I mean, you, you get a lot of valuable data out of it at a, at a base level. And even if it's not catching all the esoteric vulnerabilities or maybe the most cutting edge stuff, you're going to hit most of the big ones. If you want to check that out, it's at openvoss.org. Yes. So the way that we did it, um, we actually planned that into their, uh, th this is again why kind of talking about program versus project-based security is really important. Um, and that's a great question. So uh, I would expect that normally, but what we did was we partnered up with the, the people presiding over those operations teams uh, and adjusted kind of workloads and tried to find some other ways to maybe automate or, or cut off other manual tasks that they were doing to give them that like 30 minutes to an hour that they could spend doing that. Um, and then we ha give, gave them some criteria to focus on the most like valuable aspects coming out of those threat intelligence feeds. Because that's one of the big challenges of threat intelligence, right, is actually getting data and then taking it and translating that into some kind of action. Um, for, so for them, that was the way that we dealt with it. We, we kind of got everybody at around, you know, around a table talking, saying, okay, this is important. Let's figure out how we budget this time in. And that was the only way that, I, that in, in my experience, I've had success actually making that happen in small teams. So does that answer your question? Okay. So um, let's talk about infrastructure lifecycle and identity and access management. So once again, infrastructure management, we're talking about things like reducing attacks, attack surface, closing split up positions through good design, enhancing other controls. Now, I want to highlight something here before I go forward. If we talk about IT operations and design, designing things, right, typically, especially in companies the size that we're talking about, that's been done by somebody with no security background. And that's been done by somebody with no security background on a tight time schedule and, and limited budget. So when we talk about that, uh, we talk about what a way to have the conversation around why those kind of architectural changes are important to implement post-game. Uh, it's really important to kind of extrapolate it like this, or this is the way I've had success in doing it. If you, if you break down good IT operations practices and secure IT operations practices, secu information security practices that pr relate to IT operations are really just very good IT operations practices, right? And if we break down really good IT operations practices into the business impact that they have, those are really just good business practices. They enhance, help the business at, at, in an ideal situation, and they should be moving the general efficiency and operational stability of the organization forward. So from an infrastructure management perspective, that's a really great way to have that conversation. And the way that we drove that uh, and drove a lot of the changes and created benchmarks was using the uh, CIS security benchmarks. The, the security benchmarks that I just mentioned, uh, they have lists for all different kinds of systems and they're only adding more over time. If you have not seen them, uh, go check them out. They're, uh, they give you a pretty good chunk. Usually it's between 30 and 60% of the settings that are available from a security standpoint in terms of controlling access or controlling rights. And they give you a really solid baseline to start from. And from there you can develop kind of how you want to implement those changes and future changes with the settings that they identify as 
on a by use basis or use case basis. Uh, another big one, uh, and I mentioned air gapping, I mentioned VLANing, uh, something that these companies very commonly don't do because it's, you know, requires a little bit more network knowledge, maybe out the door to design it this way, is segmenting their networks. Network segmentation is critical. Effective network segmentation is critical. Because if you can, if you can effectively segment your network and restrict network access, you've cut down on the, the amount of crosstalk and impact that any security fire can have. And you give yourself more time and more points to catch that throughout the network. For example, if I have an accounting department and an engineering department, accounting and engineering have no reason to be, be able to talk to each other. And if somebody in accounting gets a piece of malware on their machine and that malware takes over that net, all the hosts in that segment of the network, and we've set up access lists on the switches and on the firewall preventing access to those other VLANs, or at the very least, stopping the traffic that meets the criteria for those ACLs, we're then getting alerts that something is going on. And we can be more aware from an incident response perspective when we're compromised and how and, and where it's happening. And we can isolate it. So now let's talk about lifecycle management. Uh, really, uh, what the point I want to make here, uh, we're getting, getting a little shorter on time, uh, is for lifecycle management, don't forget that this is a multifaceted conversation. From a IT operations perspective, it's a conversation about how we're purchasing what and when. It's what money is worthwhile to invest to, to you know, maybe close loops on some of our older hardware. How many people were in the process, you know, in the last 10 years of getting rid of XP in their environments? Raise your hand. Like everybody? About half of you? So, I mean, think about if you're not having conversations around that, think about how exposed you are with those kind of systems in your environment. It's no different with, like, old, old network infrastructure or older, you know, servers, things like that. Things that have been around longer have generally more research done on them from a security perspective, and so they make you more vulnerable. Um, and so from that capacity, a lot of people, you really want to think about that, cross-pollinate that with your asset management, cross-pollinate that with your configuration management, and really kind of maintain an overall understanding of the state of your business from that perspective. Uh, talking briefly about identity and access management, um, one of the things that I like most um, that a lot of folks can do that's relatively simple and doesn't cost anything, because most of us have some, one or more products that are out in the, you know, out in the world and everyone wants cloud now, right? So we have all these cloud-based platforms, all these cloud-based applications that are doing things, moving data, storing data, what and whatnot. Um, a lot of them have either an API or, or capabilities to integrate with, you know, through LDAP with authentication stacks that you have set up and manage within your environment. Really look, talk to your vendors, figure out which ones of them can do that. And, and get that set up where you can, because that's a really easy, quick win that doesn't take a lot of change on, on the part of your environment, and it gives you that whole other layer of auditing and security in terms of accessing those environments and, and tools. So I want to talk for a little bit longer about incident management. Uh, incident management, again, we're talking about how we, how we detect, respond to, manage data involved in, and generally assess the risk and impact when a compromise occurs. If you don't have an incident management program, if you haven't looked at, at this stuff, if you haven't thought about it, if you've had trouble having conversations with it, go check out these resources. Google, Google Incident Management 101, Incident Handling Process for Small and Medium Businesses, and Incident Handler's Handbook. They have great starting points for, for everything from policies to procedures. They have forens you know, data capturing worksheets that you can use if you don't have something formal in your environment. Um, and SANS actually puts out a whole score of these forms. They update them periodically um, that, that are a great starting place. Um, so we actually got through this a little bit faster than I thought, so I'm glad. And now for something completely different. Uh, but not really. Once again, winner's here. We're in the middle of this. We, we need to recognize as security practitioners 
the impact of what the task that's before us, regardless of whether we have the resources and the time, and regardless of whether we feel like we're about to get crushed by something much larger than ourselves, we have to keep calm and do it together. So once again, my name is Stephen Legg. I'm at Zen Mode on Twitter. These are all the things I do. Uh, I'd like to open it up to questions at this point if anybody has any. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do that with um, a number of different things, depending on the cycles that are how much volatility you have, how much you know in and out you've got. Uh, you can do that with anything. You know, PoshSec has a module that was developed by Nick Jacob that uh, is really great for that. It's scan, you know. Periodically, so you can drive it to scan uh, for new assets on the network over time. You can identify them. Basically, it's all about baselining. So if you know the MAC addresses, the you know the host names of all the assets you should expect to find there, and suddenly that changes or you see a new one, that's how I would, that's how I would drive the, the initial management of a situation like that. You know, obviously, when you start talking about paid products, you can talk about you know things like. Um, like AirWatch and all the, the mobile device management platforms that are out there. But at a baseline level, with just you know tools that you have in front of you, you can accomplish that with anything that has that scan scanning capability. Even if it's just you know scripting an end map every so often, just to get an account for those things, that's even helpful. The important thing is to have that baseline understanding of what should be there so that you know when you do a scan and you see something new, hey, I need to investigate this. So that does that answer your question? Okay. Mm. So, well, unfortunately, yeah, you are. Uh, unfortunately, at least not in any way that I'm aware of, um, the open source community hasn't developed a tremendous amount of tools to help manage that. Um, so, really. Again, talking about free, you know, no cost solutions, you kind of got to manage it where you can get the data. So, um, because you can't get, there's not a lot of like, agent driven solutions out there. I don't have a great answer to that question. So, it, there's, there's nothing that I'm aware of at this moment uh, that, that can help with that. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, any other questions? Brett? Mm -hmm. So it largely depended on uh, where their critical data was and what was most important to them. You know, like in the case of like the healthcare provider, that was most of their you know EPHI environment, like their their electronic medical record systems. Um, so a lot of the the selection process revolved around where the most where, where the golden goose was kept, right? So we started there, uh, drove it primarily by business cases, and then from those business cases developed. You know what extremities they were going to touch, so you know it's it was a lot of infrastructure management. It was a lot of uh, um, you know communications management. How we're how we're monitoring, separating, and encrypting access to those systems, and then to a lesser extent identity and access management. So uh, what I would encourage you to do as you guys are going out and doing this in the world, look at where your all your eggs are at. Understand, you know, what systems have the most, what systems have the least, and what systems connect to those systems, and develop a um, a plan starting from, you know, closest to the heart. Because, like, if you, I don't know if you guys have seen the MySec attack or the threat model uh, process that that was put out there. Uh, Wolf actually talks about it a lot. Uh, Wolfgang Gorlick. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, there's a number of us that have spoken about it, but uh, you're just sitting in front of me, so I wanted to point you out and single you out and troll you. Um, so uh, if you look at that process, what you do once you've established the attack path, you start back from the objective and create detective and preventative controls at each level going back up, all the way back from, you know, jackpot to, you know, the persistence step, the reconnaissance step, the pivoting step, Everything to, from the initial breach all the way down. That way, you know, going back to what I was talking about with the, with the eggs, where where the most of your eggs are, uh, you're really thinking through 
what actually is going to, you know, in those scenarios is going to happen. And, and that'll help indicate to you what to focus on early uh, and where your biggest wins are going to come from. So does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? All right. What's up? Most of my set of self here. Yes. I've seen the test picture. Do you want to say anything about something? About? About my set of self here. Oh, oh, yeah. So My6 Southfield is a local community group. Uh, we get together and talk about everything from application development to IT ops to vulnerability management, simming, um, any number of topics from, from notable folks in, the, in Southeast Michigan and, and outside of that. Um, you know, generally we have a pretty good turnout of people. We do social events. We do uh, community events. Like every year we have a MySec uh, RUCTFE team. Um, there's some other things that, uh, that that go on in the community. You can check out mishsec.org uh, if you want some more information on that. Um, there's a newsletter. You should sign up for it. it ev everybody that I've ever talked to about it, and this is, I, I'm, I'm going to put on my shill hat, but I'm not really shilling right now. Uh, everybody I've talked to about it says that that newsletter is one of the only ones they read and get a lot of value out of. Because uh, we they, they commonly include a lot of things that are happening in the community, you know, uh, everything from like the ISSA meetings that happen every month, ISC squared, uh, local conferences, things like that. That's one of the ways that you know uh, B sides is promoted. Even it's it's very cool, very tight knit community, a lot of great people. Uh, there's another for the folks that live in the Jackson area. Um, there's another chapter out in Jackson run by uh, Matt Johnson and, and Kyle Sundra. Uh, they do a great job. Um, we're talking about getting a, uh, a, a cross-pollination between the two communities together here sometime, in, hopefully before the end of the year, that uh, we're looking to get some panelists um, to come out and talk about a few different topics uh, of interest to the, to the information security community at large. So um, keep an eye out for that. But yeah, definitely check out mishsec.org again. Uh, that's where you can get more information on my sec. So answer your question. All right. Any other questions? All right. This has been Building a Sturdy Foundation. Thank you very much.